Hi there. Today we're going to take a look at something called radian measure. This is a new way of measuring angles and we will see why we need it and how it's related to our typical way of measuring angles which is degrees or perhaps revolutions of a circle. And so to start by a warm-up we're going to look at converting some familiar things like time and speed into other units. So we'll start off by multiplying 20 minutes by 1 we're going to multiply by 1 in a form that gets rid of minutes and introduces hours. So we want minutes to be in the denominator so that our um, factors of minutes in the top and the bottom can cancel. We want to introduce hours. So we need to ask how many hours belongs to or is equal to how many minutes. And so hours is smaller so we need fewer of them and we have 1 hour is equal to 60 minutes. So we put that here for our conversion factor. Now we notice that the value of this fraction is equal to 1 it does not equal 1 over 60 because this is not really um, just the, the number 1 over 60. With the units it transforms the, uh, the quantity of 1 to be a quantity of time. And so we have something in the numerator which equals something in the denominator and something divided by itself is 1. So we're going to keep that in mind that we're multiplying by 1 in a form that converts our units. So now we end up having 20 times 1 hour over 60 or 20 times 1, which is 20 over 60 times hours, because this is really 20 over 60 of hours, which is times hours. And we can reduce 20 over 60 to 1 third. And because we are measuring something with a unit, make sure to include the unit. In part B, we want to convert the same 20 minutes into seconds, so we will come up with a conversion factor. We know that 1 minute is equal to 60 seconds, and so we can use that as our conversion factor by putting the minutes in the denominator and the seconds in the numerator. So 60 seconds equals 1 minute. The value of that fraction is 1, and we can simplify. Minutes divided by minutes is 1, and we're left with 20 times 60 times seconds all divided by 1, which is 2 times 6 is 12, times 10 times 10 gives us 1,200 seconds. I encourage you to pause the video and try the rest of these on your own making sure that you look at the process. This is really what I want to emphasize here is a good process. In number two we are converting a speed of five meters per one second, which I will write as a fraction here, by uh, converting meters into kilometers and seconds into hours. So I'm going to multiply first of all to get rid of meters and introduce kilometers. So one kilometer is equal to a thousand meters. You could write that down as your conversion equation if you needed to. Um, we're going to translate that or transform that into a fraction that we multiply by. That will get rid of the meters, but then we need to take the seconds and convert it into hours. I'm going to do this by two steps. I'm going to get rid of seconds, first of all, and introduce minutes. As we saw, 60 seconds is equal to one minute. So that will get rid of seconds, but now we have minutes. We can now new, use another conversion from minutes into hours. And so we're really just seeing where each unit goes so that as we simplify or reduce a fraction. We cancel those and we're left with hours. After all of this is done we have kilometers in the top and we have hours in the denominator. So we have the right format for our conversion. We know that 60 minutes is equal to one hour. So now we're just going to tidy this up and put it all in one fraction and I'm going to put the unit of kilometers per hour at the end. So I'll have 5 times 60 times 60 in the top over 1,000 times 1 times 1, which is 1,000 in the denominator. And rather than multiply 5 times 60 times 60, we're going to simplify our fractions, um, reduce common factors in the top and the bottom. Now I see here that I have 5 divided by 10, which is the same as 1 divided by 2. I don't need the 1 times because I have placeholders of the 6s here. Well, let me just rewrite that. So far I have 6 times 6 divided by 2 kilometers per hour which I can now write in this kind of slant fraction form. And 2 divides into one of the 6s, 3 times, so we get 3 times 6 is 18. So 20, or sorry, 5 meters per second is equal to 18 kilometers per hour. Okay, we've got two more. We want to convert 210 degrees into revolutions of a circle. So the first thing to notice as our conversion statement or factor is that one revolution of a circle is equal to 360 degrees and therefore 210 degrees will multiply by 1 in the form of revolutions over degrees. So 1 revolution equals 360 degrees. We reduce the degrees and we can make a fraction here now that says 210 over 360 and all of that is multiplied by revolutions. And then we just simplify the fraction, reduce the zeros or 
actually we're reducing a 10 in the top and the bottom. And then 21, we could write that as 3 times 7. And 36, we could write that as 3 times 12. So we can simplify this to be 7 twelfths of a revolution. So a little more than half of a circle. In number four, I'm coming up with something that is not, it's made up, it's completely, it's completely uh, random. And I'm doing that so that we can bridge to where we're going, which will seem random at first because it's new. So we want to take 23 flakes, whatever they are, and convert them into tims. So again, we want to multiply by one in the form of tims over flakes. And so here we're going to get uh, 7 flakes is equal to three, 13 tims, so 13 goes in the numerator and 7 goes in the denominator. And so we end up getting 23 times 13, the flakes over flakes reduces, all divided by 7, and that is the number of tims we have. Now, if you want to multiply 23 times 13 by hand, you should be practicing this. You could say this is 20 plus 3 times 10 plus 3, and then we can use our regular algebra expansion. So 20 times 10 is 200. 20 times 3 is 60. 3 times 10 is 30. And 3 plus times 3 is 9. So we end up get, getting 299. So 299 divided by 7 number of tims. Again, if we had a calculator, we could approximate that as a decimal. But we don't have to. We can leave it as a fraction. That's the exact value. A decimal would be an approximate value. Okay, so what does this have to do with circles and why did we spend time converting? We want to talk about more meaningful ways to measure um, an angle. Now, we're very familiar with degrees and we know that there are 360 degrees in a circle. And so by the definition of um, a degree, we think that we take a circle and we chop it into 360 equal pieces. Imagine that each piece is like a pizza slice. That pizza slice of a circle is called a sector. And what we're saying is we've chopped the circle up into 360 equal pieces. So one degree equals the angle of a sector of a circle that has been cut evenly or divided evenly into 360 pieces. So I'll write that down. We're dividing the circle evenly. And we might wonder why 360? What's relevant about 360? Well, 360 is pretty close to 365. And there are 365 days in a year. So as the sun moved in its orbit around the Earth, each day was pretty close to 1 360th of the orbit. Now 360 has more factors, numbers that can divide into it than 365. So it was really good for early um, navigators and especially sailors to use 360 because they were able to make lots of fractions and parts to do their navigation. So what I want to point out is that while it was practical for navigation, it was a bit arbitrary in terms of just picking a number we want to divide a circle into. So you can invent your own angle measurement. You can take your favorite number and you can invent an angle called one of your names. So if I said one Gibson is equal to one seventh of a circle. So from now on, I could get the whole world to change and measure angles using the Gibson. You could do the same thing with your name and your favorite number. Um, the point here is that there's infinitely many ways we can do that. And so for each of these ways, we can invent a new angle measurement. So none of them is really more meaningful than another. Instead, we're going to define the angle of a circle sector, which is, um, well, the pizza slice is a sector. So if I draw a different sector, the angle of a sector is right in here. I'm going to call that theta. And we can divide the circle in a way that makes it meaningful to other things about the circle. So think about some quantities that are meaningful to a circle. We have things like the radius, the diameter, the circumference. Those are all meaningful values to the circle. And we know that the circumference is 2 pi r. And we know that the diameter is 2 r. And so both of those quantities really depend on the radius. So if we were to pick one fundamental quantity about a circle, it would be the radius. If you took a pencil 
and a string, and you traced around, you could draw a circle using a really rudimentary compass from the pencil and the string just by coming up with the radius. So the question now is, how could we measure the angle based on the radius quantity? Well, what we're going to do is imagine taking a string, and we're going to take this length of the string, and we're going to wrap it around the circle. So if you have a piece of string, or uh, kind of a measuring tape, you could measure something that will bend, not a ruler. So you could measure the radius length from here to here, but then you can lift up that bendable measuring tape and you can wrap it around the arc of the circle. And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to form one radian as the angle when the arc length, or the length around the arc of a circle, and the radius of the circle are equal. And so let's do that. Ideally, if you had something to touch and hold, you would wrap that round. And so if we took a measuring tape and we went as far as we could, we could come up with a sector to about here. And this arc length here, this distance, would equal one radius. And this distance, of course, is one radius. When that happens, we're going to define this angle right in here as one radi... well, we can't call it a radius because we're already using the term radius for something else. So it's going to be one rad, which is short for one radian. And so a radian is a special kind of angle when the radius of the circle and the radius of the sector that we've cut are equal. So now if we wrap that a little bit further, we can go for another radius distance and take us to about here. We can go for another radius distance and take us to about here. I don't have them exactly um, accurate because I'm not measuring them. And so I would have one radius, two radius, three radius, or one radian, two radians, three radians. And then here we have a little bit. So this is a little bit. So to go half of a revolution, we go one, two, three radians plus a little bit. And if we keep going from here, and we wrap the distance, which is the, R, uh, the radius of the circle, we go to maybe about here, and then we go to about here, and we go to about here, and we end up with another little bit. So we can see it a little bit more accurately in this picture here. I've wrapped it around with a computer so we have it exact. So you're basically looking here and we see that we have one radian, two radians, three radians, four radians, five radians, six radians. So let's just go back up the page and it asks what is the greatest whole number of radians that fit into a circle? And that would be six. But we actually get six and a bit around a whole circle. So one revolution which is equal to 360 degrees, is actually equal to six and a bit radians. So let's just take a look at this next part of the question. We want to figure out exactly how much that bit is. So if we think about the circumference of the circle, we said that circumference is equal to two pi r. And I just want to imagine for a minute 2 pi, we know that that's approximately 2 times 3.14, so it's about 6.28 r. What if we said circumference is equal to 6 r? This would be 6 times r, which would be 6 of r. And so those 6 r's, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, when we're multiplying 6 times r, what are we doing with those 6 r's? We're not multiplying them because 6r's multiplied together would be r to the 6. Instead, 6r means to add those r's together. And so if, this isn't true, but if the circumference equal to 6r, that means we would have 6 radiuses all the way around the circle. We would have 1 radius, 2 radius, 3 radius, 4 radius, 5 radius, 6 radius. But 6 radius doesn't actually make a full circumference. We're missing a little bit. And that little bit that we're missing is another part of a radius. So plus 0.28 of a radius. Well, in fact, 6.28 is the approximation, but the exact value for 6.28 is 2 pi. So what we're really saying when we write the equation c equals 2 pi r, I'll write it here, 
Circumference equals 2 pi r means that we have 2 pi number of radius. So we wrap this many radiuses, radii, around the circle, and then we will cover the entire circumference. So again, let's take a look. We wrap one radius, two radius, three radius, four radius, five radius, six radius, and a little bit, which is about 0.28 of a radius. The exact number of radius values is two pi number of radius. So this is setting us up for our conversion factor. We know that a whole revolution is 360 degrees. And how many radiuses or radians does it take? Well, it takes approximately six and a bit radiuses, and that bit is 0.28. But 6.28 is the approximation. It takes exactly 2 pi number of radians, where 2 pi is approximately 6.28. Well, now when we look at 360 degrees and 2 pi, 360 and 2 pi can both be divided by 2. So let's take this first conversion equation and divide everything by 2. So half a revolution is going to contain 180 degrees, and that will contain pi number of radians. Now if we look here, pi is approximately 3.14, so we get 1, 2, 3 radians plus a little bit. This little bit is about 0.14 of a radius or a radian. And so this is going to be the conversion factor that we use. Just like we used 1 minute equals 60 seconds, or 1 kilometer equals 1,000 meters, this is going to be our new known conversion factor. So let's rewrite it over here. We're just going to focus on the degrees to radians. We have that 180 degrees is equal to pi radians. Now I want us to be really, really careful. We're not all of a sudden saying that pi is equal to 180. Pi is still approximately 3.14. Pi doesn't equal 180. That's not true. Nor is it true that one minute, um, well, or nor, I should say one, one is equal to 60. We know that one minute is equal to 60 seconds. But without those units, we can't say that 1 is equal to 60. This is just false. In the same way, pi does not equal to 180. OK, so let's take a look at a conversion question involving radians. Let's go to example 1, or exercise 1. So here we want to convert radians into degrees, and then we want to go the opposite direction. So we're going to use our conversion factor that 180 degrees is equal to pi radians. And so for the first one, we're going to multiply by 1 in the form of degrees in the top and radians in the bottom. That'll cancel the radians, and then we just fill in how many degrees equals how many radians. Now it's not one radian. It's about three and a bit radians for 180 degrees. So don't think that the unit is called a pi radian. It sounds kind of like a pirate. It's not one pi radian. It's pi number of radians. So pi is the number of them that we have, and radian is the thing. OK, so we simplify this, and we see that we can reduce the radians top and bottom. We can also reduce a pi in the top and a pi in the bottom. That's kind of nice. And then we have 7 times 180 over 12, and that's the number of degrees. So 7 times 180 over 12. Don't get kind of in a hurry to multiply straight across. Let's reduce the 180 and the 12. And we can see that 6 will go into 180. 6 goes into 18 thir three times, so it goes into 180 30 times. And 6 goes into 12 two times. Now, we could say 30 divided by 2 is 15, and then multiply by 7. It may be easier for you to multiply 7 times 30 and then divide it by 2. It is for me, so I'm going to get 210 divided by 2 number of degrees and then divide that, we get 105 degrees altogether. OK, let's try the next one. We have 5 radians. Here we don't have the number pi written in there, which is fine. We'd work the question the same way. We multiply by degrees over radians. So 180 degrees over pi radians ends up reducing the radians, as we expected. And we get 5 times 180 all divided by pi, and that's the number of radians. Now, as a quick way to multiply by 5, we can think of as 5 is a half times 10. So instead of 5 times 180, we could take 10 times 180 and then divide by 2. And so that number is going to, this is my scratch working out. I'm putting it off to the side. I'm going to get a half of 1,800, and half of 1,800 is 900. So for me, that's faster than 5 times 180. So we get 900 divided by pi, and that's the number of radians we get. 
oh, sorry, degrees that we get. Now you can approximate that with a calculator to so many decimal places. In fact, if we think of pi as being close to 3, then 900 divided by 3 is about 300. Now we're dividing by a bit more than 3, so we should get a little less than 300, 290 something degrees. So you could approximate that. I'll leave it to you to try it on, on your own. Now we're going in the reverse direction, so I have a negative angle and I multiply by radians over degrees. Again, the units are important. Without the units it doesn't make sense and your communication is wrong. So we reduce the degrees. We can also reduce a factor of 10 in the top and the bottom. And now I'm just going to tidy this up. We get negative 30 pi over 18 and that's the number of radians. So we're just going to reduce the number parts of the fraction a little bit. We see that um, 3 goes into 30 and 3 goes into 18, but so does 6, so maybe we can go a little bit bigger. 6 goes into 35 times and 6 goes into 18 3 times. So we have negative 5 pi divided by 3 and that's the number of radians we have. We often read this as negative 5 pi by 3, indicating divided by 3. So for the last one we have 1 over pi number of degrees. I just put the 1 over pi in brackets so we didn't think that the degree only affected the, the 1. Kind of like exponents, we want to use brackets to show that everything inside the brackets is being affected by what's outside. So I'm going to multiply by 1 in the form of radians over degrees. Pi radians over 180 degrees. The degree symbols reduce and we have a pi in the denominator and in the numerator that reduce, so this one is actually a bit straightforward. We have one radian over 180 and we just regroup that as one over 180 and then times radians at the side. Okay, what we want to do is get really, really fluent with our degree to radian conversion and the angles that are here in this table are the really, really common ones. So we're going to come up with our conversion factors for these. There's lots of patterns and with time we'll see how these are related, but for now I want you to pause the video and come up with a couple of these. Um, let's maybe start off with the 90 degrees, the 180 degrees, and the 360 was given. So try that, pause the video, and see if you can't fill in some of the rest of them on your own. Then uh, I will have the solutions here, the answers, and you can fill in the table. Really you want to memorize these like you do powers, squares, cubes, your times tables, and just some basic number facts that we can work with easily. So I want to point out that I'm not just doing the conversion, but I'm doing a graphical or a visual representation. So we've come up with 0 degrees is 0 radians, 90 degrees is pi by 2 radians, 180 degrees is pi radians, and 360 degrees is 2 pi. Oh, I missed one, 3 pi by 2. So we have these different degree radian conversions. And one thing to notice is that because the radian is so meaningful as it's essentially a scale factor from the radius to the, the arc length. We don't have any units for it. We could write radians here, but we don't have to. So anytime an angle is written without a unit, I will assume that because it's the default measurement that your angle is in radians. So if you say something like an angle is uh, 30, I'm going to assume that you mean 30 radians instead of 30 degrees. So if you mean degrees, you have to put the symbol in. Otherwise, for angles that are in radians, you don't need the unit. Now, the other thing I want to show is that I've taken these angles and I've color coded them. My version has colors along here. And I'm just labeling the angles 0 degrees or 0 radians, pi by 2 radians at 90 degrees, pi radians at 180 degrees, 3 pi by 2 radians at 270 degrees, and back around, the first coterminal angle to 0 is 2 pi radians. So take a moment, if you have these different colors, list all the colors in green over here, and then the purple ones and the blue ones, and superimpose them on this, this circle so that we have a graphic organizer for all of these numbers. You can put both the degrees and the radians here if you like. I can easily write those in as well. So that's 90 degrees. This is 0 degrees and this is 360 degrees. This is 270 degrees and running out of room here but I'll put it inside 180 degrees. So this is going to be a really good way to cement the degree radian conversion. So do the rest with all the other angles, fill in the table and I will pause the video, fill it in and you can check your work. Okay, here are the different angles. You can just scroll through, you can pause the video if you need to make some corrections or some changes. You can take a screenshot if you like. So we essentially have quadrant one 
for the first three, 30, 45, and 60. So this is quadrant one. And then at 90 degrees, we have a boundary. Then the next three angles is going to be quadrant two. And then we have 180 degrees is a boundary between the quadrants. And then between 180 degrees and 270, or pi and three pi by two radians, we have quadrant three which are these three angles. Of course, there are lots of other angles in between. These are just the special angles that we need to work without a calculator. And then in quadrant four, which is between three pi by two radians and two pi radians, we have quadrant four. And so quadrant one, quadrant two, quadrant three, quadrant four. Just take screenshots and then fill in that, fill in the, the graph, the graphic organizer if you need. And the next thing we're gonna take a look at are the special triangles for the 30 degree, 45 degree, and 60 degree reference triangles that land in quadrant one. So we're going to draw those triangles again up in the space above here. I'll draw a green one for the 30 degree angle. Now I'm asking to use radians to measure the angle. So we can still put 30 degrees, but I'm going to put pi by six. And then I'm going to use two for all the hypotenuses so I don't have any fractions. My opposite to 30 degrees is one and the base or adjacent is root three. Then I'm going to use purple for my 45 degree reference triangle. I want to really make that triangle look isosceles. So I want the base and the height to be equal. And we have a hypotenuse of two. And we have a reference angle of 45 degrees which is pi by four radians and both the opposite and the adjacent lengths are square root of two. And then the final reference angle that we need to work without a calculator is the 60 degree reference angle. And so that's essentially the first triangle, but rotated. And so we have 60 degrees or pi by three radians. Again, we're using the hypotenuse of two. The longer of the two legs is th root three and the shorter of the two legs, the one that's opposite the 30 degree angle is one. Now, I'm not using the angles up here because we will always measure our reference angles or indeed our angles in standard position from the horizontal x-axis. So I don't want to really confuse um, the picture by measuring other angles because our focus is going to be the angle here in standard position measured from the x-axis. So these are all the really useful tools that we need for working with trigonometry. So you should be able to do all of these, um, sketch these triangles, from memory really quickly. You should also get a really fast conversion between these. You shouldn't have to work out or show the conversions. You should just know that two pi by three is 120 degrees. Okay, we're gonna do another connection between the arc length and the radius of a circle and the central angle theta now. So theta is the central angle of the sector or the pizza slice. S is the length of the arc or the arc length and R is the radius. So we're going to take this circle of unknown radius, and we're gonna complete the table of values here. For, imagine that this is a fan, and that you're opening the fan up, and initially the fan is closed. And so when the fan is closed, the value for theta is zero degrees, or zero radians. So how much arc length do we have along here? Well, since the fan is closed, there's actually zero arc length, zero centimeters or meters. Whatever we measure the radius in, we're measuring the circumference in, and, and the arc length. <coughs> okay. Well, we can fill in some other tables of values. For example, we know that we can fill in all the radians now. So 90 degrees is pi by 2. 180 degrees is pi radians. Then three of these 90 degrees. 3 times 90 is 270. So 3 times pi by 2 is 3 pi by 2. And then 360 degrees is 2 pi radians. Well, we know that a full 360 degrees is a full circle. So if we were to open up this fan all the way around, we'd be talking about the circumference of the circle. So the arc length for 360 degrees, or two pi radians, is actually the circumference, and we know that the value of the circumference is two pi r. So if we only go halfway around to 180 degrees, or pi radians, we would only have half of that circumference, or arc length, which is pi r. Another half, way around, or a quarter, quarter turn, would give us pi by two multiplied by r for the arc length, or one half pi r. So we could write it in a different way. One half pi r. And if we went three quarters of the way around, we would have three of these quarter turns, so we would have three halves pi r for the arc length. So what we're going to do is just plot this along the x and the y axes. So I'm going to let y equal s, which is the arc length, 
um, let's just say we have it measured in centimeters. And we have x here, which is equal to the value for theta, which is measured in radians. Okay, so x is theta, and we're measuring the angle in radians. I think I'm actually going to just write x equal to theta right along there. So x is going to be our angle in radians, and y is going to be our arc length in centimeters. So let's just plot a couple of numbers along the y-axis. Let's make uh, this big line here, let's make that 2 pi r, and this is pi r, and halfway through here would be a half pi r, and 3 quarters of the way would be 3 halves pi r. And so we can plot some points. We know that when the angle is 0, the arc length is 0, and if the angle is 2 pi, the arc length is 2 pi r. If the angle is pi, then the arc length is pi r. If the angle is pi by 2, which is right here, then the arc length is 1 half pi r. And if the angle is 3 pi by 2, which is halfway along here, then the arc length is 3 over 2 pi r. So we go up to that height. And we see that we have a line. The points on this graph form a line. So if you have a ruler or a straight edge, it'd be better to sketch that. Still not very tidy. And so the next thing we want to do is to determine an equation that relates s and theta. So if we think that s is actually y and theta is actually x, we know that the relationship, the shape of graph that we have is a line, and so the equation that we need for x and y is y equals mx plus b. So we wouldn't use y equals a times b to the x like we saw in the exponential growth and decay a unit because we don't have an exponential growth or decay graph. We're going back to our linear equations. And so we can find b because b is the y-intercept. So let's just pick a couple of points. I'm going to pick 0, 0, and I'm going to pick this point here, pi comma pi r. So from here, I know that the value for b is going to be my y-intercept, and so b is equal to 0. The next thing I need to work out is the slope, and the slope is going to be the rise over the run, which is going to be delta y over delta x. Delta y is going to be y2 minus y1, so pi r minus 0, divided by x2 minus x1, so pi minus 0. So we end up getting pi r divided by pi, because those zeros don't change the numerator and denominator, and we can reduce the fraction so that the slope is equal to r. So we know the slope is equal to r, and we know that y is equal to s, and we know that x is equal to theta. We know that b is equal to zero, so we have an equation that says s equals theta r, or r theta. So this is going to be our equation that relates these three quantities, the arc length, the radius, and theta s equals r theta, or as it's more commonly known, s is equal to theta r. Both of these are the same. So if we state the relationship in words, we're just saying that um, I, I really like thinking about this, uh, this quantity here. I take my central angle, and my angle could be any one of these kind of arcs, those angle arcs are all the same, but I scale it or grow it or multiply it by the radius. So r is like a scaling factor for my angle to get to the actual arc length that I want. So scale the, scale the angle in radians by the radius to get the arc length. So rather than the word scale, I'm just going to use the word multiply. Multiply the angle in radians. or scale, because scale means multiply, by the radius to get arc length. I've run out of room here. To get arc length. Okay, so we have a verbal description, and what we've just done here is really more important than the answer. We've done some modeling. We've used verbal, graphical, algebraic, and numerical, the table of values, to come up with a relationship. So this is really what mathematical thinking is all about. We now have a formula that relates these three quantities. Very often we're just told things, we're told that this is the formula, and then we are told to use it. But what's really powerful about this modeling is that 
it allows us to come up with any formula from kind of first principles. This is really the act of being a creator, of being um, an inventor, as opposed to being a, a data technician, somebody who just plugs numbers into, into computer programs. Okay, exercise three then says to find the length of an arc. So a circle has a diameter of 10 centimeters. We could sketch a circle. And then if the diameter is 10 centimeters, that might be helpful for you to consider that we're not looking at the radius yet. We want to know what is the length of an arc whose angle is 200 degrees. Well, I probably wanted to rotate that a little bit and draw it horizontally. So if that's my circle and I want to go 200 degrees, I'm really talking about going from here to about here. And I want to know the length of all of that red arc. So I have my formula and I could use that for method one. which says S equals theta R. Now I need to know theta in radians, and I don't have theta in radians. I only have theta in degrees. So my, uh, my angle here, theta is 200 degrees, and I need to convert that into radians. So 200 degrees, I multiply by one in the form of radians over degrees. So pi number of radians over 180 degrees gives me, I can reduce my degrees, divide a 10 in the top and the bottom, and I also have a common factor of 2 in the top and the bottom, which gives me 10 pi over 9, and that's how many radians my angle is. And then my radius is actually not given, so I have 2 radius, which is equal to the diameter, which is equal to 10 centimeters, and so from there I know that the radius is equal to 5 centimeters. So my arc length is going to be my angle in radians, 10 pi by 9, multiplied by the, the radius, which is 5 centimeters. Now, remember we said that the radians doesn't need to be there. This is really just an indication that we have taken something in, in centimeters and divided by something in centimeters, so there's really no unit there. It's, it's a scale factor. And when I multiply through, I end up getting that the arc length is equal to 5 times 10, or 50, times pi divided by 9, and the units that are left over are centimeters. So we have the arc length. You could approximate it to a decimal, but we don't need to. We can leave it as an exact answer. Now, we're asked to use two different strategies to answer this question, so let's try this question again. The second strategy really just involves proportions. So if I know that um, a whole circle has a circumference, which is equal to 2 pi r, then I can figure out what fraction of the circle I've gone and use a proportion of that. So what fraction of the whole circle is the sector? So again, we have our center and we have the central angle to about here. So theta is equal to 200 degrees or pi, 10 pi by 9 radians. Well, we know that the fraction is going to be the, the number of degrees divided by the whole number of degrees in a circle. So the fraction is going to be 200 degrees divided by 360 degrees, which incidentally is the same as 10 pi by 9 radians divided by the whole number of radians in a circle, which we know is 2 pi number of radians. Now, it might be a little easier to simplify the fraction from the, uh, the degree form, but if you did it from the radian form, you'll get the same fraction. Namely, we see that we get 20 over 36. We can divide both of these quantities by 4. So 4 goes into 20 five times, and 4 goes into 36 nine times. So we're going a little bit more than half. So 4.5 out of 9 would have been halfway. We're going a little bit more than half. That seems reasonable. So we figure out what the entire circumference is, and then we multiply or scale it by the fraction, the part that is the sector compared to the circle. So we have um, the arc length of the sector is going to be 5 ninths of the circumference. So 5 ninths of the circumference is going to be 5 ninths times 2 pi, which is going to be the circumference of, uh, sorry, times the radius of r, rather. And our radius value we said is 5, so we're going to get, let's see, i just pull this up a little bit. Um, we're going to get 
five centimeters for the radius. Well, I'm not labeling this very well. So we're going to get five ninths times two pi times the radius, which was five centimeters. And so altogether, we're going to get 25 times two, which is 50 pi divided by nine, and that's the number of centimeters. So we get the same answer both ways. And in fact, you'll see that really what we did here, when we got this five ninths, five ninths times two pi, that gave us our central angle in radians again. So we're really just taking that central angle in radians and multiplying it by the radius. To go back to evaluating sine and cosine then of angles, we're just going to do the same thing that we did in the last, in the last lesson, 13.2, but we're going to do it with the angle measured in radians now instead of degrees. So the first thing I'm going to ask you to do is to pause the video and recall what our old definition of cosine and sine are and our upgraded definition when we're dealing in the unit circle or around the plane in x and y coordinates. So we've got uh, an old definition for cosine from geometry and a new upgraded definition. We also have an old definition for sine and an upgraded definition. So just pause the video and write those two formulas in. So we used to say that the cosine was the adjacent over the hypotenuse, and that's still true. The problem with adjacent is that it's just a positive distance. So when we're dealing with um, reference triangles, we might have to reflect that triangle into a quadrant where the adjacent side is no longer positive because there's a direction to it. And so we are going to upgrade adjacent with x, and we're also going to imagine that these triangles lie inside a circle. And so the hypotenuse of the circle is going to turn into the radius of the circle. Or I should say the hypotenuse of the triangle we upgrade as the radius of the circle. Similarly, for the sine of the angle, so our angle lies here or it maybe lie here because it could be in different quadrants, we used to have that sine was opposite to theta over hypotenuse. Again, these are both distances for a triangle that essentially lies in quadrant number one. But if we rotate or reflect that triangle into other quadrants, the angle is no longer between zero and 90 degrees. So we can have angles that are any size. And as a result, we upgrade the opposite as the y coordinate and the hypotenuse, we call it the r. So the radius is, is still positive, but the x and the y coordinates can be positive, negative, or zero. And so we really want to take our three reference triangles and use those to place them into the appropriate quadrants. So let's take a look at a nice circle and look at these four angles. So I'm going to take a circle. I prefer to use a circle of radius two. And if I use a circle of radius two, that kind of works. I'm going to first place my radius along the pi by six or 30 degree mark. And so if I do that, my pi by six angle lies here. I have a radius or hypotenuse of two. I have an opposite or a y coordinate of one and an x or an adjacent of root three. So I could come up with the coordinates of that point as going right the square root of three number of spaces and up one. And so if I wanted to work out the cosine of pi by six, I would take the x coordinate or the adjacent over the hypotenuse or the radius. So we get the square root of three over two. Now let's just keep going with the cosine of these other angles. To get these other angles, I just take this triangle and reflect them into quadrant two, quadrant three, and quadrant four. And so I don't really have to work that hard. I just need to know that when I reflect horizontally, the sine of the x-coordinate changes. So for angles that lie in quadrant two, which this one is, oh, let's just put the angles in degrees here. Let's do that first. So pi by six is going to be 30 degrees. Five pi by six is going to be 180 degrees minus 30 degrees because we're just cutting out that reference angle a bit. So this is 150 degrees. Seven pi by six is going to be pi, pi plus the reference angle or 180 degrees plus 30 degrees. And 11 pi by six is going to go all the way around one full revolution and then take away the reference angle of 30 degrees. So this is going to be 330 degrees. So we have all of these angles lying in different quadrants, but they have the same reference angle. So we're going to use the same triangle that we sketched the reference triangle in quadrant one. 
So the only difference we have is whether the x and the y coordinates are positive or negative in each quadrant. And so you can imagine coming up with the new coordinates for the same radius, negative for x, positive for y, negative for x, negative for y, positive for x, and negative for y. And so from here we can use our upgraded definitions of either x over the radius or y over the radius to come up with a sign at each of these angles. The next angle, of course, is measured from here to here because we measure standard position as always starting from the positive side of the x-axis. And so when we take a look at that ratio, we're going to get the x-coordinate divided by the radius is negative root 3 over 2. The same is true when we get the angle for the next, or the cosine of the next angle, we're going to get the x-coordinate divided by the radius, which is negative root 3 over 2. But in the fourth and final quadrant, our angle is going to be a positive root 3 over 2. So we can see that cosine has two positive answers and two negative answers for a full revolution of a circle. Similarly, we work on the, the sine of the angle and we're going to use the y-coordinate divided by the radius. So the y-coordinate is 1 over 2 in quadrant 1. In quadrant 2, the y-coordinate is still positive. Now that's just because above the x-axis, all the y-coordinates are positive. So the y-coordinates are positive in quadrants 1 or 2, which means that our sine of an angle will be positive in quadrants 1 or 2. But in quadrants 3 or 4, the y-coordinates are negative because the, those y values lie below the x-axis. So when we get to quadrant 3, we're looking at the negative 1 for the y-coordinate divided by 2, and in quadrant 4, negative 1 for the y-coordinate divided by the radius of 2. We do the same thing for the next four angles, except these four angles don't have reference triangles because those triangles have a collapsed base or height. And so the triangles are really just lines that lie on the four axes. So let's first write those angles in degrees and then fill in the cosine and the sine for each of those. Here we have theta is equal to 0 degrees, theta is equal to 90 degrees, theta is equal to 180 degrees, and theta equals 270 degrees. Okay, so we look at the cosine at 0 degrees or cosine at 0. We can imagine there's a point here. If this is a circle of radius 2, then we're going two spaces to the right and not up or down. So this would be the point 2 comma 0. Similarly, if this is a circle of radius 2, we're going two spaces up to get to the 90 degree mark or um, the pi by 2 mark. So we're going 0 spaces right or left and up two spaces. If we go 180 degrees, or the pi angle mark, we're going two spaces to the left and zero spaces up. And then to get to the final point down on the circle, we're going zero spaces right or left and two spaces down. So then we can use our x and our y coordinates combined with the radius of this circle. In this case, we've chosen a circle of radius 2. You can choose a circle of any radius, and in fact it's very common to choose a circle of radius 1. There's a really good reason why I like to use a circle that's, whose radius is not 1, because if we don't involve the radius, we tend to forget about it. And where we're going, we really need to make sure that we remember the radius. Okay, so let's figure out the cosine of 0 degrees. We put our point on the 0 degree marker, or direction, which is to the right, and the x-coordinate is 2 divided by the radius, which is 2, and 2 over 2 gives us 1. At pi by 2 radians, the x-coordinate is 0 and the radius is 2, so 0 divided by 2 is equal to 0. At the pi, or 180 degree direction, the x-coordinate is negative 2 divided by the radius of this circle, which we've chosen to be 2, gives us a cosine of 90 of 180 degrees, or cosine of pi equal to negative 1. And lastly, the cosine of the angle at 3 pi by 2, we take the x-coordinate of 0 divided by the radius of 2, and we get 0. If we repeat the process for the sine at each of the angles, we're now going to pick off the y-coordinate divided by the radius. So we get 0 divided by 2, which is 0. Then we get 2 divided by 2, which is 1. And then we get 0 divided by 2, which is 0. And then we get negative 2 divided by 2, which is negative 1. And so this is how we can do the process of evaluating sine and cosine and other trig functions for the special angles, the ones that we've got in that big long table up here, um, you, without using a calculator. 
So we really want to have a good idea about which angles are connected. Um, we want to see families of triangles and we'll group them together in a different way. But if we, if we saw that this is our reference triangle here, it gets reflected over here, it gets reflected down here, it gets reflected down here. This is the same thing that we were doing in the last question where we had our four triangles and we were looking at the coordinates of the points that got sign changes as we reflect through. Remember we came up with those triangles from our memory. These are the three triangles that we need to know. So this green triangle, this green triangle, and this green triangle all convey the same information. So we're really just layering bits and pieces so that we can become a bit of a mini calculator to work out these expressions, these values without a calculator. So from here there are some questions that you can do for practice on arc length of a circle, converting degrees and radians, and working out the sine and the cosine of some special angles in both degrees and radians without a calculator. That's all for now.